I'm not going to stand here in front of one of the great wonders of the world and argue about an old movie. I'll go back inside. If you figure out some plan to make 800 bucks last a lifetime, knock on the door. I'll be in there. You're listening to the Keeping Your Money Show with Jamie Westenbarger and Bart Steinler. All right, welcome back to the Keeping Your Money Show. Jamie Westenbarger joined as always by Bart Steinler. If you missed my voice, I'm back. If you didn't, then I'm still back. <laughs> <laughs> Tough luck. Like it or not, here I am. Um, if you've never listened to the show and you're like, who are these people? This is Keeping Your Money Show. Cut through all the bulls, the booyahs, bells, whistles, honks, and horns to get you to the information that actually helps you move towards retirement. We were discussing uh, Rashad Jennings, former NFL player, how he prepared himself for retirement, um, and some good stuff that he, you know, talked about doing, and I think uh, some lessons that could be learned for those of us that don't make eight million dollars a year. <laughs> But, um, you know, something that happens a lot of times, and I know you've had this too, Bart, somebody comes in, uh, maybe they heard us on the radio, maybe they saw me on TV, maybe they've come to one of our events, maybe they golf in our outing, uh, that's July 26th with all money going to Kids Food Basket. More information, go to keepingyourmoney.com. Um, but, uh, but for whatever reason, they're sitting here, and, and a lot of times... I don't want to say a lot of times, but sometimes the conversation becomes, well, what if I kept half of my money where it is now and I moved half of it to you and then I'll just kind of see how you guys do, right? Mm -hmm. Or they'll um, come in for an annual review and they'll say, you know, my wife's IRA is doing a lot better than my brokerage account or my Roth is outperforming my IRA. Well, you know, I, I want to know why, or that's not acceptable, or, you know, mm -hmm. why would this account do different than this account, right? And one of the things that as advisors we have to do is kind of recraft that conversation, right? Because it's so important to look at your portfolio as a whole. And you're doing yourself a disservice when you say, why does account A perform in such a way that account B doesn't? Because many times it's important for account B to do something different in your account as a whole. And there was an article in Proactive Advisor Magazine that I thought really kind of hit home on a, an analogy that I think works for that. And it's the analogy of baseball. And the idea that some of the most amazing baseball teams of all times. They use the Yankees uh, from from back in the '60s and '70s, and even you know the '80s, and you know all of these teams and how how great they were. But you know Reggie Jackson was a completely different player than Joe DiMaggio, right? You yep. know, um, both Hall of Famers, both very important to the teams they played on, both very different in the way that they were important. Mm -hmm. you, and you look at that with really any kind of team. You could have a really important defensive player who's terrible at the plate, but his defense is such that you make up for it elsewhere because you want him as your center fielder or your shortstop. I think that, you know, when I read this article, what came to my mind was the 1968 Detroit Tigers. And for those of you that are old enough to remember that team, it was like there was a different hero every day. And in fact, at the end of the season, um, Ernie Harwell actually put out an album called The Year of the Tiger. Mm -hmm. Albums were things that you put on record players and played. Right, I've seen those. Day. I've seen those on um, antique auctions. Right, right. But one of the points he actually made in there is that the reason that the Tigers were so successful that year is that because there was a different hero every day. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Jim Northrup about six or seven times during the year hit a grand slam home run, which mm -hmm. won the game. You know, uh, Denny McLean throughout the season carried him with 31 wins from the mound. Denny McLean was not so dominant in the World Series, and then Mickey Lolich stepped in and won three games in the World Series. So it was a combination of different people stepping up and being a hero. And the portfolio over a long period of time works in the same way. Uh, I talked to one portfolio specialist earlier this year at a meeting, and one of the points that he made is that if everything in your portfolio is performing well, there's a chance that there's something wrong in the structure of that portfolio mm -hmm. because you, you, certain things should be performing well while other things are protecting you. And then as the, um, as the strong sectors rotate and become the weak sectors, then some of those weak sectors are going to be the ones that are 
that where the weak sectors now are going to be the performing sectors later. So if you're looking at it uh, at a point of comparing one to another, it really is a short term snapshot mm-hmm. when you have a long term goal. The other thing is in that same vein in staying on the the team concept, you know, rarely in any sport is a championship won because of one player, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there are rarities. You know, Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan was pretty amazing. Yep. Uh, LeBron James has carried teams in basketball further than those teams would ever dream of going without LeBron James there, right? But they're also very susceptible to if something happens to that star player, I mean, forget it, the season's over. Right. And sometimes when we look at our portfolios, we're looking for that star player, right? We're looking for that that investment that beats the market by 20%, right? And, and maybe our neighbor told us about some stock we just have to have, right? Mm-hmm. And and it seems sexy and exciting and man, I want that, you know? And I think back to the dot-com days when everybody wanted to find, you know, the, the internet stock nobody knew about, you know, finding Apple before it's Apple. And today we hear it about whether it's marijuana stocks or it's cryptocurrency or, you know, whatever. But everybody wants that sexiness in their portfolio. Everybody wants Michael Jordan on their basketball team, right? Right. But you know what? The Pistons beat Michael Jordan a couple different times and not one of those guys would ever have been considered the best even in that year at, at any position. Mm-hmm. They just assembled the perfect team to make a run for that entire year. And your investment portfolio really is the same. It's not like it matters. Um, you know, you're not going to be like sitting down with, for a drink with a friend and be like, Phew, my bond positions? Oh, man. I'm telling you, I have the hottest bond positions in my portfolio. Yeah. I guarantee they're better than yours. You know, yeah. th- that's not a conversation that's going to happen. But I'll tell you what else isn't going to happen. You're also not going to be the guy who says, man, my entire portfolio moved down today because of such and such and such. Because if you're diversified, like you were saying, they should be counterbalancing to, to, to each other. Now, a lot of people say, well, doesn't that hurt return? Well, it depends on what your definition of return is. You know, one of the things that we see so often is people like to talk about this concept of average return. But I can do the math for you any way you'd like to do it. I can show you an average return that actually will make you less money over time than a consistent return. Because if we have too much volatility in that average return, you'll be able to say, man, I'm making 8% on average, but there's gonna be years in there where you get whacked. And then those years you get whacked, it it negates all of the good things you've done in that and kind of gives you a false sense of, well, I'm doing okay. You know, um, you're not doing okay. No, and and what you want to is is when you're looking at return, you want to look at a risk adjusted return mm-hmm. and not just a return, because a risk adjusted return is taking into account what we're doing to um, take some of that volatility off of the portfolio. One thing you mentioned earlier in this segment too, you talked about how sometimes people will come and they'll say, well, I'll give you 50% and I'll leave 50% where I'm at and I'll, and I'll, I'll see who does better. Mm-hmm. What you're really doing when you do that is you're encouraging, you're teasing your advisor to try to amp up your portfolio. Absolutely. And when you amp up the portfolio like that, you're actually trying to convince your advisor to put more risk in there because that's the only way you're you're going to win that game that you're that artificial game that you're saying well and that's not necessarily in your best interest i'd say many times it's not oh yeah i mean let's just take a look at it uh, hypothetically over the course of a year Mm -hmm. you invest with two different advisors on january 1st and on december 31st whichever one made you the most money that's who you're going to go with right Mm -hmm. so advisor a made you six percent hypothetically but your volatility was almost non-existent. You just kind of plugged along all year. There were no there were no heart palpitations. There were no late night phone calls where you were concerned about Trump's policy on tariffs or anything, right? The other advisor by the end of the year made you eight, but in the middle of the summer, you were down 10. Mm-hmm. I, which portfolio do you want? You know, Well, I guess it depends. If you're 32 years old, maybe the second one sounds fine. If you're 68 and taking income, I don't think, I don't think 
plan B sounds all that great, you know? So, so you have to be able to put yourself into the shoes of what station of life you're in too. And, and is volatility something you want to be a part of? You talk about the two advisors competing. It's very similar to what we saw with some of these lifestyle funds and these these retirement funds that are in a lot of 401k accounts where you just pick the year you're going to retire and they're supposed to adjust themselves, you know, based on, well, there's been a number of companies where, you know, there's been kind of some concern that they become more aggressive in those because their performance was lacking. When you name your fund, whatever you name it, it's maybe a little harder to compare it to your competitors similar fund because they're named nothing alike. When your fund is a 2035 fund, pretty easy to compare it to the other 2035 fund. Right. So now all of a sudden there's this competition, which is causing a lot of these funds that should be maybe even 50-50 as far as, you know, fixed income in, in equities are maybe more 70-30 because they're trying to get better performance because they're competing with other companies out there. So. Right. They want to get on all these platforms for all those 401ks. And so, yeah, that's what they do. Exactly. All right. We're coming up, we're going to talk about a national company in the sales, in the spotlight again, not highlighting them so much as the pervasive nature of sales culture in the financial services industry and what you can do to protect yourself for it right here on the Keep Your Money Show. There's no one size fits all when it comes to planning your future. Jamie, Bart, and all of the advisors at the Keeping Your Money Show understand that your financial goals are unique and your needs are going to change at varying stages of your life. Our team of advisors can help you tailor a financial plan that meets your unique needs. Call us today at 1-888-98-MONEY or visit keepingyourmoney.com to schedule your free initial consultation.